Thank you for that completely underwhelming introduction as usual. Uh, thank you guys, thank you for being here tonight. I'm sure we'll have some fun in a little while. We had a session with the performance coaches last night and I gave them the choice of hearing it the hard way and the straight way and the honest way or taking the soft option. And make sure when you see these people sneaking in late because they don't want you to look, right? They want to try and pretend that they're in completely invisible and you don't want to draw too much attention to them. Make sure you do exactly the opposite. Make sure you all look at them as soon as they come and make them feel really self-conscious. That's just a bit of fun. <laughs> the other thing you can do, guys, with your phones, and I understand that you will all play the game, like I want to check a text and I want to see what's on TV and who got in the Ferns squad today and all that stuff, and then you'll pretend to me that you're actually taking notes. That's perfectly fine. I understand that. Do what you've got to do. But if you could keep it on silent, that would be really, really useful. That would help me a hell of a lot. And apart from that, let's just relax and enjoy ourselves. So let's do what I call the upside down unlecture tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have there any questions? Let's go. Let's go. This is called the unlecture, the upside down lecture. Let's start with your questions. Instead of waiting for an hour and a half, the other good thing is that if you get your question answered after you've had sushi, you can look at the time. I'm going to drive back to Auckland tonight. Fast and Furious 8, Wayne Goldsmith in the gorge, about 10.30 tonight, oh, looking forward to it. So guys, let's go, questions. Why have you come along, what do you want to talk about? Yep? What's your key point? Tonight, commitment is everything. Commitment is everything. Don't look at me, everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Far too many people are wrapped up in what they see in front of them. And the key message that I give you is don't be obsessed with physical talent. People tend to worship physical talent, particularly prodigious talents where kids are 10 or 11 years of age and they score 122 tries in a year and everyone says, well, there's the next All Black. And that quite often happens, guys, around the world. Every story that you've got about a really precocious young talent and a kid who could have done anything and how remarkable they were, 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age. The kids who people say they could have been anything. Sad truth is, most of the time, they end up doing nothing. The pattern is, the kids who are remarkably talented, the biggest, strongest, fastest athlete at 9, 10 or 11 years of age, most of the time, the kids who could do anything end up doing nothing. Because we overemphasize physical talent. Physical talent does one thing and one thing only at a young age. It gets you noticed. It gets you recognized. But without commitment and without the values and without the character to drive that talent, the athlete never realizes their full potential. I've been a physiologist now for 24, 25 years. I was the head physiologist for the Australian Rugby Union, head physiologist for Swimming Australia. I led the Brumbies Innovations Group called BIG, Brumbies Innovations Group. I was the head of sports science, sports medicine for Triathlon Australia. Don't look whatever you do to try to duck. That makes them even smaller. <laughs> That's okay, he's too big for me to argue. We just ignore him completely. <laughs> Let's not embarrass him. We don't want to have any sideline issues in this room. And guys, as a sports scientist, my suggestion is you is to move on from physical talent. Don't be obsessed with how big, strong and fast kids are at a young age. It's a very, very poor indicator of their end point. Some really interesting statistics. I'll throw a whole bunch of stuff at you and you can accept it or reject it. About over 25 years and looking at multiple sports around the world, there are some interesting patterns. Australian schoolboys team, 16 year old boys, Team selected in the last 30 years. Now you would think when there's so many players going to rugby academies at 18 and 19 years of age, that if you get in the Australian schoolboys team, and I'm sure it's very similar for you, if you get in the Australian schoolboys team, you'd say that's a fairly good indicator that they're going to be a wallaby, or at the very least, be a super rugby player. Now, you'd think that's a fairly good indicator. My kid was in the 16s, Australian schoolboys touring the world, I'd say, here we go. Professional contract on the way, things are not that far. 
What percentage do you think of kids over the last 30 years, kids who've been in the Australian schoolboys rugby league, rugby union team, rugby league to say, but the Australian 16 years Wallabies, what percentage of them do you think make it to professional level? 2%. About 8%. Yeah, about 8%. <coughs> and yet when you talk to their parents, they think that they're just one tiny, tiny step. So the tiny, tiny steps that she's taking just to sneak up the way there. They will tell you that it's just one small step away from being a professional player. And this pattern's very, very consistent. So again, guys, to get in that 16-year-old Australian schoolboys team, it's generally being recognised by physical talent and skill level. And it's a very poor indicator, very poor indicator of where they're going to end up. So to answer your question, that's what I've learnt more than anything else. The one, the one thing, I'll, and I'll illustrate it this way. And those of you that have seen or heard me present before, I hate PowerPoint. I would seriously burn every copy of PowerPoint I could get my hands on. It's PowerPointless. You don't end up talking to people. What people end up doing is they take a photo of the slide, they don't take notes. And then while they get their phone open, they text their mates. So I can do it, but I absolutely hate it. So to follow on from your question, this is what I've learned. I say to people, say, what's the most important thing you've learned 25, 30 years of this? If I said to this room, okay guys, thanks for coming. I want you to go home and do a project about sport in New Zealand. See you at nine o'clock. Some of you will go home and go, well, what a waste of time that was. I haven't got the time to do that. But look, I'll better do it because I made the effort and I've got half a page handwritten. Forget to put their name on it. And they did what I asked them to do. There'll be a whole group of you who'll go home and go, well, this is quite interesting. I'll challenge myself a little bit and I'll do two pages, I'll type it up, put my name on it, hand it in. And they did what I asked them to do. And one or two of you will go home and say, wow, what a challenge. Can I do this tonight? I haven't got a lot of time, I'm really busy, but I want to see how far I can take this. And I'll have six pages and I'll put it in a, a black folder and they have a picture of a silver fern on the front, a New Zealand flag on the back. I'll hand it in early and they'll say, look, that was really interesting. Can I contact you next week and do something similar because I want to learn? And they also did what I asked them to do. And that's what I've learned. It's the kids and the people that think differently that get where they want to go. Everyone's tied up and thinks about the physical stuff. If I get the training program of the Ferns, my kids will be as good. Or if I get Michael Phelps' training program, all I'm going to do is follow that. I've got to follow those steps. And my athletes will similarly be good. And it just doesn't work like that. It's the way you go about doing what you do that makes all the difference. They're the things that are enduring. Everything else is a fad. So there is a rule tonight. Don't ask me anything you can Google. I just like don't answer those questions. So someone says, oh, how many times a week should a... 10 year old volleyball player, I'm not going to answer that question. Look it up. That's what your phone's for. But the question you just asked was a brilliant one to start with because I can share those things with you. Everything else, look it up. That's what you've got your technology for. Yep. How do you move people from C to A? Exactly. Great question. Great question. If your mind expands from thinking about the physical limits, or the physical aspects only. If you start to move beyond that, then you can start to move into that. <coughs> so if you've got a child there and you say, you know what, I think we're getting beaten for speed, we need to do some speed work, what's that going to look like? What are we going to do? <coughs> well, what are we going to do with them? Then we do some speed training. Going to do some sprints, going to do hills, we're going to do all that stuff. If I look at a young child and say, you know what, I think there's some aspects of your play we need to improve, we'll work on your passing. What's that going to look like? And do some passing drills and passing under pressure and passing at speed, whole range of things. And I look at a child and I say, you're not committed enough. Coach commitment. You're not dedicated. Coach dedication. You have no confidence. Your coach confidence. If you're coaching, if you don't understand those concepts, don't say it to your kids. Don't look a child in the eyes and say you're not committed enough and you're not trying hard enough and you're not dedicated unless you understand what it is you're talking about 
and how to turn it around. But so many of us are focused on what we can see. You're not strong enough to do weights. You're not big enough to do weights to change your diet. You're not fast enough to do sprint work. Just those things. What we try to do, and I think where coaching is heading more and more, is this stuff. We often say to the coaches, this, these soft skills and coaching these things is more important than ever. Why? What does this thing give you? What does that mean that I've got in the palm of my hand now? I have in my hand the same knowledge and information that every person in the world currently has, more or less. <coughs> Coaches still think that they've got a secret training set or a secret routine or a secret practice schedule that no one else has got and that's what's going to make all the difference. And it's not. Everyone knows what you know. The internet means anyone can get anything, anytime, anywhere for free. So all those secret routines and secret sets and all those, get over it. Get over it. That's not the advantage. Guys, knowledge was only your advantage when no one else had your knowledge. Now, everyone's got your knowledge. Kids in Scotland have got your knowledge. <coughs> Coaches in Tunisia have got your knowledge. They can all access, and parents as well, can access the same information in the palm of their hand. So your knowledge is not the advantage. The knowledge now comes as an athlete and as a coach understanding how to think like this and how to take whatever you get and make it special. I'll give you an example. Goal setting doesn't work. Goal setting doesn't work. Not the way we do it, if you want to be great. Put your hand up if you set a New Year's resolution this year. <laughs> Who did a New Year's resolution? How many of you managed to stay with it up until now? What, 2%? 5%? Goal setting in theory is a pretty good idea. Champions don't think like that. They don't just sit there and go, oh, in 12 months I'll make a team, or in three years I'll be in the Olympics, or in eight years. That's a dream they've got. It's in the back of their head. But you, you spend some time with a great athlete, and they think about this. They think about this moment right now, right here, present here, how do they get the most out of this next stroke, or this next punch, or this pass? They get everything out of it, and they're engaged in what they're doing. That's why they're so good. 50 kids doing the same program, one kid stands out. Everyone says, oh, it's genetics. Rubbish it is. Rubbish. That might be part of it, but that'd be fairly obvious. Guys, real physical talent is harder to hide than it is to find. Yeah, it's but what you notice, the consistency around the world is the kids who are able to think like that with whatever you give them. So simple story, guys. I've got a chance to work with the US swimming team last year. Michael Phelps, Ryan Lochte, Katie Ledecky, Missy Franklin, about 60 <coughs> Olympic medals in the pool all at once. Very serious group of athletes. And talking with their coaches that night, same as you asked, what makes a champion? What's the difference? between a good swimmer and a great swimmer? What's the difference between a good athlete and a great athlete? Conclusion from that coaching group, working with the best group of swimmers in the world, by far, said, it's as simple as this. A great athlete, in any given situation, when given the choice of doing things the easy way or the hard way, will always choose to do it the hard way. 5 a.m., alarm goes off, easy way, hard way. Hit the snooze button, easy way. Get up, grab the sports bag that you packed the night before yourself, go and make yourself something to eat, knock on mum's door and say, excuse me, mum, would you take me to training? Easy way, hard way. I said that to a bunch of swimmers the other night, another part of the country, and they laughed. So I'm glad you think it's so funny. Your chances of making a national team, I'd say, is next to zero, if you think that's funny. Because that's the difference. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. Easy way, hard way. The kids come home from school, <coughs> drop their bag on the ground. Easy way, hard way. Up, empty it out, put their dirty lunchbox and anything that's left over, the sandwich bits of the, the crust they don't want to eat in the bin. Empty their bag out, clean their bag ready for the next day, start doing the homework straight up, hard way. Easy way, hard way. 
Guys, success is a choice. Success, everyone's got the same 24 hours that Mozart had, that Picasso had, that Bill Gates had, that Richie McCaw's got. Everyone's got the same 24 hours. You choose to use it any way you like. And if you choose mediocrity and shortcuts and the easy way, that's what you get. That's what you get. Can you coach that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The only way you can't coach that to kids is if you're unwilling as a parent to stand your ground. Guys, the words no, the word no to a teenager is not the commencement of a three-hour negotiation process. The words no mean no. Nine o'clock, time to turn off your electronics, my son. Because we know the way that that particularly interactive games like Minecraft and Halo 3 and all those things, they just fire up a part of your brain that you don't want to have fired up at that time of day. And we know the blue light stimulates you in such a way as it impacts on the quality of your sleep, certainly before midnight. And so you walk in as mum and dad and you go, time to turn it off, and you enter the just zone. Like, I've just got to text Amanda, and then I've just got to yeah. finish this, and then I've just got to, and you go, okay, make it 15 minutes. And you go back in 15 minutes later, and you go, hey, come on, come on, you got to get up early in the morning going cycling, you know you got to have sleep, you know that guy said, about turning the phone off so you get good quality of sleep or turning off the iPad, iPod. I've just got to do this, Mum. All right, I've just got to wait because I've just got to do this and I'm just going to do it and it's the just zone. And you go back in at 10.11. An hour later, and they're still going. Doing those one-word conversations with their BFFs. And their bays and all those things. And you just... And... Say, so, come on, it's time to go to bed, this is enough. And they go, oh my God, mum, I so can't believe you said that. You're like, oh, you're just like, oh my God, you're just like, like, you're just like. You know the ones that have only got two things they ever say, oh my God, and like. That's it. There was a, some gymnastics or circus kids on one of those shows this morning, on the, one of the breakfast shows, and they interviewed one of the kids and he says, like, circus is like really good and like, what I like best about being in the circus is like you get to improve like your fitness and like your skills and like your circus. <laughs> he actually only said seven words. <laughs> the other 715 were the words. <laughs> so you as a parent, you as a parent, you just back off and back off and back off. You're not teaching them commitment, you're teaching them that the easy way is always there for them. All they've got to do is talk the way around. Is setting a standard. It's the same as in the morning. This is my house. Does this sound like your house, everybody? Six o'clock. I coach pretty early, so this is how. Hey guys, time to get up. We're heading off at seven thirty this morning. Nothing. All you get. Oh my God! Oh And they roll over. Six fifteen, six twenty. Hey guys, come on. Gotta get up. Get our breakfast. They start. Moving slowly, start to get the momentum going. Seven o'clock, hey guys, come on, and the checklist comes out. Guys, shoes, lunch, hat, jacket, water bottle, bag, homework, we're going soon. 7.30, get in the car! <laughs> Every morning, the same thing. <coughs> because we allow it to happen. If you allow it to happen, you get what you expect. For the parents in the room, stand up, not now, stand up if you've looked your child in the eyes today, today, and made them know with absolute certainty that you love them and you accept them for who they are as a human being for no more than the fact that they are your child. Stand up. Thank <laughs> you.